Hey everyone, and welcome to Abundant Life. We're so glad that you're here this morning. My name is Lauren. And my name is Mario. Church, what I love about our church is that we love to connect with people. And one way you can do that is by following, liking, or subscribing to all of our social media pages at Abundant Life LS. You can go to YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram. We post there about our sermons, how to get involved, and how to get connected here at Abundant Life. And make sure to check out our podcast called The Watching World. You can find it on any app that you would listen to podcasts on, and there's new episodes every Thursday. For more information, go to livingproof.co slash podcast. Week after week, you guys have probably heard us mention or talk about one very special thing. What is that, Lauren? Revival Weekend! (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Revival (laughs) Weekend. We're so excited about it. And probably you've never heard about Revival Weekend or have never been to it before. And so here on our host segments today, we're going to talk all about Revival Weekend. Revival Weekend is Abundant Life's huge family reunion. We want to gather at our Lee Summit campus for a three-day event full of worship, great teaching, and so much fun. We want everyone there, whether you're from Lee Summit, Blue Springs, Independence, or even our online campus. So if you call Abundant Life your home, we would love for you to travel here and spend the weekend with us. If you are coming to Revival Weekend, we obviously want to know that you are joining us. So go ahead and register at livingproof.co slash revival. Let us know you're coming. You're going to receive some free resources. We cannot wait for you to join us. So the key focus for this year's revival is forgiveness. We're going to be having different messages across the weekend on the gift of forgiveness, forgiveness of yourself, and forgiveness for others, and forgiveness from Christ. So listen, church, mark your calendars right now because Revival Weekend is coming up real quick. It's going to start on Friday, August 19th with worship and a powerful message from Pastor Phil. Last year, Pastor Phil even brought out a python. He did. Kind of crazy. And one thing we're doing different this year is we're going to have our very own family fun fest. This is going to be taking place right in the middle of Revival Weekend. So you can join us for that on Saturday, August 20th at 5 to 8 p.m. We're going to have food trucks, lots of games, live music. But what's special is we're going to celebrate baptisms with all of our church congregations. So make sure to be here. And finally, we're going to have two services on Sunday, one on Sunday morning and then one in the evening. If you need more information about Revival Weekend, visit livingproof.co slash revival. Hey, we want you to serve on our host segments. Are you really good on camera like Lauren? She's really, really good. And we'd love for you to uh, join our team and be able to check out what happens behind the scenes. What do you have to do, Lauren? You have to go to livingproof.co slash serve and sign up with the communications team. That's right. You get to see all that happens behind the scenes. There's Carter and serve on our team. So join us for our host segment. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hey, if you haven't signed up for Revival Weekend yet, go ahead and do that because we want to see you there. That's right. And hey, we're getting ready to jump into service and have a powerful time of worship. So lean into the word of God, lean in for community, grab a cup of coffee if you're at home. Just it's going to be a special day. So we can't wait to see you here.
Jesus and all that he does. He's over everything. There's nothing that's impossible for him. We can call upon his name and believe by his word that chains can break, walls can fall down, seas can be parted in Jesus' name. And that breaks down so much more than just uh, that metaphor. Like it plays out in our personal life, fear, anxiety, shame, all these things. And I'm reminded of this command in scripture. It's one of my favorites, but it's one of the hardest. It says, don't be anxious about anything. Who does that really well? Because I don't, I don't know. I haven't figured that one out yet. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, make your request made known to God and the peace of Christ will guard your heart, will guard your mind. You're in Christ Jesus. You have the peace of Jesus. Anxiety is going to come. Fear is going to come. Shame. Those things are going to come. Trouble, sickness. But Jesus reigns over all of them. And he calls us to bring those things to him. 
to cast our cares before him. Aren't you thankful for a God that wants to know what you're dealing with? He wants you to cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. And he wants to remind you of this truth. So I'm just gonna ask you today to just step out of boldness and faith and to be brave. We have, we have people who wanna pray with you. And if that represents you today, fear, you're just fearful over something. You're anxious today, your thoughts are anxious over something. You're feeling shame today. You're, you're going through some kind of trouble or pain or sickness, something. We believe that things change right here in the presence of God as we gather together in faith. And I want you to step out as we sing that again. We're gonna choose worship over worry right now in this moment. We're gonna choose praise over fear and shame. We're gonna choose that the cross is enough. We're gonna believe that. So we can stand here in boldness, full of faith, full of hope, and lift this song to him. So right now, as we, get, we begin to sing this again, just step out in faith and receive the, the peace of Christ right now in this moment to replace whatever you're dealing with and battling with right now. Jesus, we call upon your name because it has the power to save, it has the power to break strongholds. We're not playing games this morning. God, we come to you in faith. Maybe you're part of a church house this morning, you're watching online, just drop something in the comments or just gather with those that you came with today. Let's make this a moment right now to meet with Jesus and not just to, to go through the motions, but experience transformation that only comes by his presence in his name. Thank you, Jesus. We believe right now. And over fear, over shame, over all anxiety, over troubles and all pain, over sickness and disease, for he reigns on the throne, all praise to him alone, one name over everything, it's over death, and over death, and all sin, over hell. Darkness bows and demons flee at the mention of his name. For he reigns on the throne, all praise to him alone. One name over everything. You sing it again. He's over fear. He's over fear, over shame. Lift this up in faith. Jesus over everything. Sing it out to him. Oh, Jesus over everything. He reigns. He reigns forever. We choose to sing to worship. Our song for all eternity. Jesus Christ.
morning. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. Why don't you take a second and greet the people around you. Tell them good morning. Good morning, Abundant Life. My name is Jeremy, and whether you're joining us in our auditorium or in one of our church homes or in your own living room, let me just say, welcome to church. We are so glad you're here. Jesus loves you, and man, so do we. So hey, you know what? I love church on Sunday mornings, and one of the things I love about following Jesus is there's always a next step. And we've got a thing called a Next Steps card. And so if you're a first-time guest here, your next step is letting us know that you're here, man. We don't want anything from you. We just want to get to know you and celebrate that you're here. So consider filling the card out or clicking the link online. And also, let me give you your very own personal invitation to our Revival Weekend. It's August 19th through 21st, and we're gonna celebrate the forgiveness and freedom that Jesus offers for all of us. Now I'm gonna switch gears for just a second. I'm gonna get serious. When you use the word hero, there's like varying degrees. Like there's like Congressional Medal of Honor hero. There's like above that, there's like Jesus hero. And then there's the average, ordinary, amazing, doing things above and beyond heroes. And in just a second, I'm gonna ask you to help me celebrate those heroes. But, but I gotta get your mind right first. So last week, 550 teenagers. I'm a dad, hold on, we're gonna celebrate in a second. I'm a dad of four of them. I want you to think of the odor. <laughs> now I want you to imagine Lake Williamson getting so much rain that the parking lot is flooded and the teenagers are swimming in the parking lot and then going to dorm rooms where there's 12 of them in a room. And then I want you to think about the 160 Abundant Life members living out our core value of service, being changed people, serving people so that serving people could be changed people. And I want you to say thank you to those 160 people. Come on. Now, we give Jesus the glory and the honor for the life change. We had over 15 students profess faith. We had students rededicate their lives. And man, we got a whole mess of them wanting to obey and get baptized. So Jesus gets the glory. But man, he worked through those 160 people. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you. Hey church, I love you guys so much. I love what God's doing here. And, and so I just wanna thank you for your generosity. It's another core value. If this is your church home, you know we got three ways to give. But for everyone in this place and online, I'm gonna ask you, will you join me in prayer for today's offering? Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your goodness and your love. Lord, I thank you for Jesus. God, I thank you for, for what you give us every day, new mercies to us every day. And so, Lord, I pray for this offering. God, I thank you for such a generous church. And so, Lord, I pray that every dollar and every dime would go to see lives changed, that it would bring people to you. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for the work you're doing in and through this body. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I hope today's encouraging and life-changing. God bless. What's up, Abundant Life? If you have a copy of God's Word, won't you find the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We are eventually going to get there. As you are turning your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I just want to welcome everybody here this morning. Pastor Phil is in the motherland, my hometown, my home state, Texas. He's down there preaching for a friend of his. And so y'all be praying for Pastor Phil as he's preaching down in Houston, Texas this morning. Um, as you are finding your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with these things called tiny dollhouses. 
But this summer when my kids got done with school, we said, hey, we're gonna give you some money to go shopping because here's something I've learned being a minority in a sorority house. I've got three little girls and a wife um, that they, women like to shop, you know? And so we go shopping and uh, we end up where, I don't know if this is all women, but this is definitely the women in my household where every woman in my household wants to end up eventually on a shopping trip and that's Hobby Lobby. So we end up in Hobby Lobby and, uh, and we find ourselves over to these tiny dollhouse kits. Now a tiny dollhouse, think Legos, but not easy to connect, all right? And so you buy these kits and like they have little little like tiny wallpaper, little tiny lampshades, and you're having to build all of it. So we each get, uh, the, the girls each get like a little tiny dollhouse and, uh, and they're like, all right, great, we're gonna go home and build these. And so here's a picture of my crew right here. They're working on them, all right? So I want you to notice there's a big mess. Here's an example of a tiny dollhouse, okay? And it's fully furnished. There are, there are, there are drapes on the windows, um, that you have to cut out, that you have to glue together. All right, and, and let me just kind of, this I don't know if you have kids or not, but you can probably imagine this. There's a few different personalities going on here, okay? My two older ones, man, they are focused on the mission, all right? They've got, they are diligent. And, you know, I've got, this one's my oldest. She's working on something. This one, you see, she's got a hot glue gun, you know, she's working on it. And then there's the, then there's the wild card. That's the baby, all right? And she's right here. She looks like she knows what she's doing. But she's probably just distracted reading somebody else's, uh, you know, blueprints or whatever. And so you have like a couple that are really, really, you know, they're, they're dedicated, they're being diligent, and then you have one that's just distracted. And my role as their, as their father and, and my wife's role as their mother is that, that our job is just to kind of keep them refocused on the mission. Like, hey, we've got a building to accomplish here. And if we don't want this thing to last until you get into college, we've got to stay focused on the mission, Right. And the reason why I share that with you this morning is because when you become a Christian, when you become a Christ follower, you are invited on this mission to build God's kingdom. And and your heavenly father is there to help refocus you when you get distracted. Your heavenly father is there to cheer you on when you're being diligent in building this kingdom. And for many of you, or for some of you rather, your heavenly father is there to correct you if you start destroying this kingdom. So this morning, I got a question for us just to kind of consider. When it comes to building God's kingdom and it comes to spending our life, I want to ask you, what are you building? What is the thing that you've given your life to that you're trying to make much of? And from God's word this morning, I want to look at the right plans. I want to look at the right foundation, the right materials, so that you and I, when we stand before Jesus someday, we can receive the right rewards. Now, some of you are already thinking, like, why are we in 1 Corinthians? Because aren't we in a study through the book of Daniel? Well, we are continuing our study through the book of Daniel in a roundabout way. And what we've been doing over the last several weeks is that we've been going line by line through the book of Daniel. We are in the final chapter of Daniel, chapter 12, and we see that Daniel has this incredible vision of what it's going to be like in the end, like in the very end. And so he gets this vision of how judgment's going to play out. And when it comes to our life, we really need to be ready for judgment. That one of the most pervasive themes in life's experience is that you will give an account for what you do. And when you read the Bible, one of the most common themes throughout the entire scripture that's uncomfortable to talk about is that God is just and that he is a judging God and that he is going to judge us according to our works. And so we need to be ready for this because if we're not ready for this, it's not gonna end well for us. And so last week we talked about the big judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. And Daniel, he has a vision of this judgment. Here's what it says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. He says this, that many shall be purified They're gonna be made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And we wanna be people that are wise this morning. We wanna know how we can be ready for what is gonna matter for eternity this morning, amen? And God wants us to be ready for those things, and so he didn't leave these sort of things just kinda nebulous and up for us to figure out. He said, I'm gonna write these things down clearly so that you can be ready for that day of judgment. He says in Hebrews 9, 27, that every man is appointed once to die and then to be judged. If you weren't here last week, it was a really, really special message in my opinion. Uh, Last week, Pastor Phil, he talked about this judgment, the great white throne judgment, the one that Daniel's talking about here, that many shall be purified and made white. And he began to share about how we need to be ready to stand before God Almighty. And the only way that any of us are ever gonna be ready to stand before God Almighty is if we've been covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That he said this, there's a heaven and there's a hell. And he pleaded with us to be ready for this day. Y'all watch this video. 
I'm trying to tell you today that if your name is not written in the book of life, you will spend forever in the lake of fire. Yes, I'm aware this is not a popular message at all in our day. It's not a message that you're going to hear in very many churches across America. This is not how you build a bigger Facebook following. But do you understand, my only purpose is to watch for your soul. The calling of God upon my life is Hebrews 13, 17, to watch for your soul. And I'm watching for your soul. I want you to awake, Ephesians 5, 14, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you life. Choose Choose life. Choose life. God is offering you life today, eternal life. Don't choose death. Jesus is life. If you don't know Pastor Phil very well, uh, you may not be able to see the grimace that's on his face. For those of us that know Pastor Phil, you can tell that there's an agonizing that's happening in him emotionally. And I would just say this, if you can preach on hell and not be in tears, if you can preach on hell and not be broken, then you've misunderstood the heart of God. And Pastor Phil last week, very rightly, he, I mean, it literally got down on his knees and he begged people. He said, please choose life. And so when Daniel's seeing this vision, he's saying, this is the vision, this is the judgment that we need to ready ourselves for. And Pastor Phil, he talked about that very appropriately last week. And I'm so grateful just for the way that he conveyed that, that it wasn't this hellfire and brimstone and you better get your life right. It's this pleading that every one of us will stand before God Almighty, before our maker someday. And I think intrinsically, even if you don't believe in the Bible or anything like this, you intrinsically know that there is something out there that we're gonna have to give an account to. And we would say, based upon the authority of God's word, it is God Almighty, and that Jesus Christ is the only hope for salvation on that day, Amen. and that you would trust that. So Daniel, he's getting this vision of this, like, great, this great judgment that's gonna take place. And again, in chapter 12, verse 10, he says that many shall be purified, and they'll be made white at that point. And then he says they're gonna be refined. They're gonna be refined. And he goes on again, it says, but, they, but the wicked, they shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. See, when you read the Bible, there's really two big judgments that are going to take place for mankind. There's the great white throne judgment that I've already talked about that Pastor Phil did such a great job unpacking last week. But then Daniel, he says that there's, they're also going to be refined, that there's this other judgment that takes place, a refining judgment that takes place. For those of us that know Christ, that are going to be in heaven, there's going to be a second judgment that we're going to stand before Jesus and we're going to have to give an account for everything we did <clears throat> after coming to salvation. We're going to have to give an account for the things that we've done for Christ. And so I want to talk about this refiner's judgment this morning. This scripture, again, it teaches that you will be judged with how you respond to Christ for salvation. That's what we talked about last week. But then it also goes on to teach that you'll be judged for what you did for Christ after salvation that you are gonna be judged in the way that you've built your life, that you're gonna be judged in the way that you used your gifts. You're gonna be judged for the motives of your heart. <clears throat> Paul, one of the greatest theologians in the entire Bible, he calls it the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, when he's using this word in the culture, they would have heard the Greek word bima, bima, B-E-M-A. And this, this Greek word bima had like really strong cultural implications in the society in which the Bible was written. Um, they would have automatically drawn to mind a, like a Corinthian uh, theater, much like this one right here. And so you can go to this place today and, and this is where people would have gathered. So think there was like a big, a big Greco-Roman games, like Olympics that was happening. And somebody won the race, they won the wrestling match, they won the whatever. And everybody arrives to this big arena and they're getting ready to be awarded their reward for winning their deal. And so they would show up to this thing and you can go to this thing today and you'll actually see that there's another picture that's about to pop up and you'll see that there's this inscription on this platform in Greek that just says Bema. And that literally means judgment seat. And so when Paul's writing about this judgment seat of Christ, his audience would have been like, oh, like the Bema seat, like when we go watch the games and, and the people, they stand up on the stage and they get awarded the things that they, that they earned, 
because of their race or whatever it is. Or they have to kind of hang their head low because they didn't make it to that place or they didn't win first place. And so Paul is saying, hey, there's this judgment seat of Christ that we all need to be ready for. And he says, it's just like the Bema seat, just like when the guys run the race and they win their award. That's what it's like for us when we're going to get to heaven someday if you know Christ. Now, there's three things I want to make clear about the Bema seat before we get into the actual text. The first thing is this, that the three, the first thing is that the Bema seat is not for salvation. It's not for salvation. Again, there's a, there's a great judgment, heaven or hell. Go to sheep, Jesus says. This is something different. This is not for salvation. First John 1, 20, or excuse me, First John 2, 28 says, and now little children abide in him, talking about abiding in God, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. <clears throat> that there's, a, there's an area of salvation that we all need to settle that is a prerequisite to even making it to the arena to go to the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ. The second thing about the Bema is that it's for believers. If you are here and you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this is a judgment for you. It says in Romans 14, 10, and, and in also verse 12, for we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Also, thirdly, about the Bema seat is that it's, it's for rewards. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all appear before, here it is, the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And then Revelation 22, verse 12, Jesus says, And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Listen, if you haven't settled this perspective in your mind, let me kind of give you a sticky perspective to hang on to. In 100 years, here it is. In a hundred years, all that will matter is what you've done for Jesus Christ. In a hundred years, all that will matter is how you built the kingdom of God. And so let us have that perspective this morning that one day we're gonna stand before God Almighty and if we know Jesus Christ, we're gonna have to give an account for the way that we lived our life in light of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that day for many of us, it will be a day of rewards. For some of us, it'll be a day of regrets. And Paul, he's using this language as he's writing to this church in Corinth, and he uses the judgment seat of Christ language with the church at Corinth more than any other church in the New Testament. And it's like Paul's gathering them together, he's like saying, hey, some of y'all are building God's kingdom, and you're being diligent, and Paul's writing saying, you keep going, you keep building that thing. And then he writes to some other people, some of y'all are destroying God's kingdom. And he's saying, hey, stop it, you need to correct that. You, you don't need to tear down what God's trying to build up, but by and large... I would think that Paul's writing to people that are much like me, that they're not, they're not being super diligent at times, they're not being super destructive at times, but the thing I fall into is I am distracted at times. You ever get distracted? I mean, my mind is like a one-way street into a cul-de-sac with a lot of squirrels and I'm driving slow, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, like it's just, I mean, I'm all over the place. And then I've got my iPhone with all the social apps and I've got the news and then the sports news and then like trying to figure out cryptocurrency, whatever that means. I mean, I'm just so distracted with all of these things. None of them are bad things per se, but many of us have come in here this morning and when it comes to us building something that's gonna matter for eternity, many of us were just distracted. And Paul, he's writing this letter to this group of people and he's saying, guys, you need to focus on the mission. Let me help refocus you so that you can live a life that matters and that will echo in eternity. First Corinthians chapter five, Paul says this, you are God's building. I love this. I think sometimes we'll come to this place and we'll think, well, you know, well, God's doing a work in that person's life. And, and maybe you've come in here and you're just kind of like, I don't know why I'm at church this morning, but, but here, let me just tell you, God wants to do something in your life, man. He wants to do something in your life, young lady. I mean, the reason why you're here is because God has a plan for your life and a purpose for your life, and it's personal. It's not just for you, it's not just meant for you and just kind of keep it underneath a rock, but God wants to do something personal in you so that he can share what he wants to do through you to the world, that you are God's building. And the more we take ownership on the mission of God, the more impact we're gonna have for the glory of God. So Paul, he just says, you're God's building. Let's make no mistake. This is a personal message for you. And he goes on, he says this, According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. He says, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Point number one, if you're going to build something that's going to last for eternity, you're going to need to have the right plans, the right plans. Paul's saying that God's grace led him to have the right plans in life. 
that he refers to himself as a wise master builder, that he's laid the foundation and that other people, they come and they build on it. He's referring to the way that he helped this church in Corinth get started, and then he gave the reins of leadership over to other people, and that they built upon the work that he has already done, but they have the right foundation, which is, we'll see in a second, Jesus Christ. But Paul's saying, I had the right plans to build the right thing. And listen, y'all know this to be true. If you don't have the right plans, you're not going to build the right thing. Like if, if you think that somehow you're gonna stumble into godliness accidentally, it doesn't happen that way. If you think somehow you're gonna stumble into a, a healthy marriage someday, it doesn't happen that way. If you think somehow you're gonna stumble into success, it doesn't happen that way. You have to have a plan. You have to have vision for it and you have to go get it. And Paul's saying that if you're gonna live a life on purpose, it's not just gonna happen naturally. You've gotta have the right vision for it. I mean, God's word is supposed to give us the plans that we need for a fruitful life. And again, you, you know this. If you don't have the right plans, the right building isn't just going to happen. Now, I know this to be true very personally because we're building this thing in the city called the Crossroads Campus. I've told you all about this. Here's a picture of me and my family there. Uh, we're on the job site. The guys weren't getting it done, so I showed up with my crew, and we're getting it done, all right? We're building the whole thing. I'm just kidding. Uh, they, they wouldn't let us do this. But you can see, like, the building in the background, like, they've knocked out holes in the, in the wall because we said, hey, we, we're planning on putting windows up here. And so they're like, okay, the plans say windows. We will knock out holes for the windows. They knocked out holes on the first floor because we're planning on putting up these, these like big open doors. And so they said, okay, we're gonna knock out these holes to put in, to work the plan. And they read the plan that we put together and now they're executing the plan. Y'all know that this is how this works. And if you're gonna have a life of purpose and of impact, and if you're gonna build something that's gonna last for eternity, you have to have the right plan. And maybe you're thinking, okay, where do we get the plan, right? If you're anything like me, you're like, I, I don't wanna waste my life. I wanna live a life of purpose. I wanna live a life on mission. I wanna build God's kingdom. Where's the blueprint? It's right here. <laughs> God's will is in God's word. And if you wanna know, God, what do you want me to do? Just open the book, read the book, do what it says. It's real simple, it's not easy. And God's word is gonna tell you to do things like, uh, like know Christ. You know, Paul said in Philippians 3, 8, that I, I consider all the world rubbish compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. If you would just aim your life and work the plan of knowing God daily, you would be building something that's gonna echo in eternity. You're gonna read in God's word things like make disciples. Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything I've commanded you. Give your life to that ambition. Go do the words that Jesus, that's not just for special Christians, that's not just for varsity Christians, that's for all Christians. You're gonna read in the word of God, whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. You work diligently as unto the Lord, Colossians 3.23. So when you go to work tomorrow, you show up, you roll your sleeves up, or metaphorically, whatever you gotta do, and you be the best employee that you can be unto the glory of God, not so that you can make a lot of money ultimately. If that happens, Praise God, not so that you can appease your boss, but if that happens, praise God, but you go work for the glory of God. And you'll find imperatives and things that you're called to do, and God has clearly laid out his plan. He has revealed so many things about what he wants us to do in his word, and that's the plan. And if you're gonna build something that matters, you got to have the right plan. Paul, he goes on to say this in verse 11. He says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So if you're gonna have the right building, if you're gonna build your life on the right thing, you gotta have the right plans. And point number two, you gotta have the right foundation. You gotta have the right foundation. I don't know if you know this much about Paul, but Paul is obsessive about Jesus. Like when you read the writings of Paul, it seems like every other word is like, oh yeah, and you gotta know Jesus. And if you try to do this without knowing Jesus, it's gonna be futility. And have I, have I told you about Jesus? Could I tell you about, Paul was chained to a Roman guard for a large part of his life. And like every time they rotated next Roman guard, you know, every six hours or whatever it was, he's like, hey, what's your name? My name's Paul, could I tell you about Jesus? And he just, he gave his, he was obsessed about telling people about Jesus so much so that when he's writing things about like, build your life on something that's gonna matter, he's like re, re turn into this reality that if, well, if, if you build it, if you get all the stuff built, but you don't have the right foundas, foundation, let me be clear, the foundation is Jesus. And he's obsessed about you and I knowing Jesus. See, if you build your life on anything other than the hope that we have in Christ, it will not last forever. 
If you've come in here this morning and this is kind of like a spiritual supplement for your life. If you've come in here this morning and this is kind of like spiritual self-help and you kind of put Jesus on the same par, uh, on the same level as like Tony Robbins, you put Jesus on the same level as E.T., you put Jesus on the same level as whatever your, your, Jim Rohn, whatever your motivational speaker is, and you see Jesus as some sort of supplement to help you arrive to your better self. Listen, you've misunderstood what the Bible is all about. You've misunderstood what eternity is all about. And if you think Jesus is an accessory into your life, you have built something on a sandy foundation. And when storms come and the winds blow, your house is gonna crumble. But when you build your life on Jesus, the foundation, it's sure to stand. See, the Bible tells us this, that you and I, we were born like a, like a condemned building. You know, you ever see one of these? Like you drive by and it's boarded up and you think, wow, they need to tear that thing down. Well, that's us spiritually, you know? I think some of us, we think that we're like, you know, we're, we're just kind of a nice house. No, no, spiritually, we're not a nice house. We are a condemned house. Condemned is a word that means not fit for use. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, instead of coming into the neighborhood, so to speak, of humanity and just bulldozing down every one of the houses, he looked at the house and he does what my mama does. She can see the potential, praise God, you know? And so we lived in this fixer-upper my whole life because she could see the potential. She's the only one that could see the, I heard potential in this house my whole life, right? And so she could see the potential and we worked on the thing, it, it still ain't done. Anyway, so Jesus, he can see the potential in each and every one of us. And he purchased the neighborhood. He purchased the house, so to speak, with his own life is what the Bible says. That even though we were a building condemned, Jesus gave his life to purchase that building. And he died on a cross and he rose from the grave so that he could move into that space and he could rearrange it so it could be something And what the word of God says, that if we are in Christ, we are therefore no longer condemned that he takes the condemned sign off of our yard, so to speak. And he says, this building, this person was once not fit for use, but because of my grace, because of my purchase, because of my involvement, he's like the divine Chip and Joanna, the divine fixer upper. And he says, I'm moving in and I'm flipping this thing into something that is gonna be beautiful and is no longer condemned, but is fit for use. And that's what it means to have the right foundation. Again, if you see Jesus as an accent, like you've ordered your spiritual house and Jesus is like the succulent that is missing on the kitchen table, and then once we get the right succulent in place, it's ready for the photos. If that's how you see Jesus, listen, Jesus is not a succulent savior, all right? He is the house. He is the foundation. And if you're gonna have something that's gonna echo in eternity, if you're gonna build your life on something that matters, you're gonna need to have the right foundation. And in 100 years, all that will matter is what you've done for Jesus. So if you're gonna build your life on something, you better build your life on Christ. And Paul's making that abundantly clear. He goes on to say this in verse 12. He says, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. Now the day that he's talking about, the reason why it's capitalized, he's talking about the, the, the judgment seat of Christ. That's the day, the, day, the refining day that Daniel sees in chapter 12, this is the same day. He's saying that on that day, the day is gonna declare what sort of materials you use. And he goes on, he says, here's how it's gonna declare it. He says, because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Point number three, if you're taking notes, you could write this down. If you're gonna build something that's gonna last an echo in eternity, you gotta have the right plans. You gotta have the right foundation and you gotta have the right materials. You gotta have the right materials. Paul's saying that you gotta build with the right materials. Like those things that are gonna survive God's judgment are the things that you built with gold, with silver, and with precious stones. Not the things that you built with wood, with hay, or with straw. And again, once you have the right plans and the right foundation, you gotta say, okay, am I, am I spending my life building with the right materials? And so Paul, what he's doing, is he's comparing these, these things that are imperishable, right? You see it there in the text. He's saying you got gold, silver, precious stones, and versus wood, hay, and straw. And then when you put a fire to the, as the testing agent, well, you know what's gonna last, the things that are gold, silver, and precious stones. Now, I think that he's just kind of throwing out some materials that are obvious that some are gonna burn up and some are gonna last. And we have to look at other parts of the scripture and we have to begin to ask ourselves, okay, what are those sort of things that are gonna be tested? But before we get there, I just want you to ask your, yourself, what are, what are you living for? 
What, what are you building your life on? I think most of us have come in here this morning and we're Americans, most of us. And there's this thing called the American dream. you have heard this before, right? And many people, they've, they've written songs, they've, they've drawn up movies, they've written articles about the American dream. There was a Reader's Digest article about the American dream. And it, and it kind of just goes like this, man, you work hard, retire early, you buy the, the beach house in Punta Gorda, Florida, Florida and, and then you, you, know, you cruise in your yacht and you collect seashells. And, and like that, that sounds awesome. I, I just got back from Florida a couple weeks ago. Florida's great. Every time I go to Florida, I'm like, can we get some of this in the Midwest? You know, like, it was awesome. It was all, I mean, a beautiful ocean and everything and seafood, seafood, like fresh seafood. It was good, you know? And so I want you to think about what are you, like, what are you giving your life to, okay? So like if, if this ladder represents your life, okay, and every rung on this ladder is a decade, I want you to think about what are you giving your life to? And there's a tendency this morning for many of us to give our life to things that are good, but are not ultimate. Like y'all, y'all know, so like, let's imagine this is like our teenage years and we're living our life and we're just, trying, we're just trying to figure ourselves out, you know, and we're trying to build relationships, maybe make varsity, get the letter jacket with the patches, you know, and then we get into our 20s and we're trying to get into the right fraternity or the right sorority so that we can make the right connections so that we can get the right job and hopefully cross paths with the right significant other. Then we get into our 30s, right? And hopefully we're married by our 30s, we're establishing our family and we're getting into our career and we're trying to make an impact Packed. And then, and then we've got our, we got our eyes set out on the neighborhood we want to live in, but the interest rates are 18%. So we can't, we got to wait till we're in our forties, right? And we get into our forties and now kids are kind of steady. We're out of baby boot camp, you know, and we're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to where my peak earning years are. We start saving some things. And then we get into our fifties and we're like, all right, the kids are out of the house, you know, and we can eventually start planning on retiring. And, and then we start thinking, okay, we're, okay, there is a house in Punta Gorda. There is a house in Panama city. There is is a house in Rosemary, whatever the beach is that we want to go to, there is a house out there that maybe we could afford. And we start thinking, this is a, this is a reality. And then in our fifties, we get to the place where we can retire now. And we're like, wow, you know, some of us, this would be the dream, right? You could retire in your fifties. Others of you like, yeah, that's not happening. But you know what I'm saying? It's the dream we're talking about. And we think, wow, I can finally retire in my fifties and I can get there to the beach house and I can, I can get the seashells. And what happens to a lot of us is we, we go on in whatever next decade and we die. And, and I think that we'll stand before Jesus someday and, and if he looks at the way that we lived our life and all we have is, is to hold out the seashells to give him for his glory. I think that we may have built our life on something that doesn't matter. Now, am I saying all of these things are bad? Like our beach houses, um, our kids, our new houses, our families, careers, colleges, varsity football and relationships, is that bad? No, not at all. But if you're climbing the ladder of life living for the collection of seashells ultimately, listen, that is a life that is wasted. Amen. But if you're leveraging those things for the glory of God and seeing those things as servants to building the kingdom of God, then you're leveraging those things for what they were intended to be. And so I can't tell you that those things are gold or wood or hay, but God will judge what's going on with what we are pursuing in our life. And if you've come in here and you, and you are pursuing the American dream over God's dream, it's all gonna be burned up in the end. So what are the things that are gonna be judged in the end? Well, here's three things that we find scripturally that are gonna be judged. The first thing is, uh, is motives, motives. Well, the word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, that God will expose the motives of men's hearts. So big question, why are you here this morning? Why, why did you come to church this morning? I think there's been times where I've showed up to church out of obligation. I don't know if, if that's anybody this morning. And like, it's just the right thing to do. And I don't think that God's in heaven going, mm, that makes me so happy. I'm just so blessed. Like the last time I went on a date with my wife, she didn't say, why are you here? And I, and I said, well, it's just the obligation. 
you know? It just seemed like the right thing to do. And she was just like, I love you so much, you know? And if you're here out of duty and not out of delight, then I think the motive of your heart is, is wood, hay, or straw. And I think the motive is really important. It's important for us to ask ourselves that question. Why did we buy the new truck? If the motive was because I wanted to enjoy the truck and it was financially responsible for me to do so, praise God, it's okay to have a new truck. But if the motive was because people are gonna see me drive my new truck and they're gonna think, wow, that guy, he's, yeah, wow. And you're looking for the applause of men, then it's just wood, hay, and straw. If you're going on the beach vacation, praise God. If the motive for your heart is right, praise God. It's not wrong to go enjoy things. It's not wrong to put your feet in the sand. It's not wrong to collect seashells. These are seashells I collected with my family. But if this is my life's ambition, then there's something wrong there. And I cannot judge the intentions of a man's heart. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, I don't even know my own heart. <laughs> but God knows the motives of our heart and we have to ask God, would you search me? And would you know my heart? And would you test my anxious thoughts and see if there's any offensive way in me? Why are you here? Why do you, do, why do you sing the songs that you sing? Why do you give? What are the motives of your heart? The second thing that's gonna be judged is our conduct. Our conduct, we've already read this this morning, but 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says this, we will receive what is due, whether good or bad. Now this word bad is not like morally bad per se in the Greek, it's the word that it, it literally refers to like whether it was purposeful or worthless. And you're gonna receive what is due based upon whether you lived a life on purpose or lived a life of worthlessness. And many of us, when it comes to our conduct, like we're gonna give an account for the, the things that we watch, the things that we listen to. One theologian says this, that Twitter will, will be present on the judgment day to prove that our prayerlessness was not for a lack of time. And how are we conducting ourselves? I was talking with Pastor Phil about this this week and he just said, you know, I mean, this is so convicting, but it's, it's comforting in the sense that sin won't cause you to lose your salvation, okay? But it will cause you to lose your reward. And so even our conduct, the way that we're speaking, the things that we're, the things that we're doing, these things, they will be judged by God. These are the things that are gonna be tested, our motives, our conduct, and thirdly, our service our service. Matthew 25, Jesus tells this story about these guys that were entrusted with a sum of money and, and some of them invested it and some of them just sat on it and hid it. And this is the passage where Jesus says that you're going to hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and it's also this passage that you hear these famous words that he who has been entrusted with a little will be entrusted with more. And we have to ask ourselves, if Jesus has given us abilities, if he's given us spiritual gifts, then what are we doing to use those? If you're at, a, at a, a, a church house this morning and God has given you a house and a living room, how are you leveraging that for the glory of God? And many of you are being faithful to say, God has given me this thing and I'm gonna use these gifts to serve him. If you are here this morning, God's given, and you know Christ, he's given you a spiritual gift. He's called you to a mission and to a purpose. How are you living your life and leveraging your life for the glory of God? It's not wrong to use your ambition. It's not wrong to use your gifts to go make an incredible living. I hope that y'all all are greatly successful in whatever you put your hand to. But ultimately, those things don't matter. Are you building corporate America's kingdom greater than you're building God's kingdom? Are you using God's gifts he's given you as a means to an end to get wealthy or are you using the wealth that God has entrusted to you as a means to an end to build his kingdom? How are you serving God? And when you stand before God someday, are you confident that you'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Because you're being faithful with what he's entrusted to you. Uh, there was a picture that we captured this week and may not look like a whole lot to you, but I, I just love this photo. And um, this is a picture of a parking lot that's filled with cars that was just this week. And every one of these cars represents an adult that went and served it one week. That these folks, they parked their cars here this week and they took vacation to go give their life away to serve teenagers so that teenagers could see their lives changed by Jesus. And this is, underneath the right motive, this is 
a week well spent. I think that, that these folks are gonna get to heaven someday and, and Jesus is gonna say, I saw the sacrifice that you made. I, I, know, I saw the face that you made when the stitch came in because the kids that were waiting through the parking lot lake, you know, they were like, this is awesome. And you're like, this is something. It's not awesome. And, and like, Jesus, I saw the sacrifice and how you push through the discomfort. And on that day, Jesus will reward those that faithfully use their gifts. But also there was, a, there was another lady, I heard this story that came in, the kids were checking in on Monday and uh, this lady shows up and she had like this care packet. I don't think that she went to camp, but she showed up Monday morning and she had put together this care packet and she presented it to one of the people that was doing registration and check-in. And, um, and she said, hey, would you, would you be able to find this person? And she had that person's name written on the care packet. And the lady said, yeah, sure. She said, well, a few weeks ago when they gave us as a church body the opportunity to get bracelets and to pray for the people that were going to one week. I picked this young lady's name. And so I've been praying for her for like a month and I just wanted to put together this, this care package. Could you give it to her and let her know that there is someone that is praying for her? And so the sacrifice to go and spend a week at, at one week so that students can see their lives changed by Jesus is incredible. But also the sacrifice just to simply pray and dedicate time to pray for people so that their life can be changed by Jesus is just as incredible and just as golden. And so how are you leveraging your life to build something that's gonna matter in eternity? You gotta have the right plans. You gotta have the right foundation. You gotta have the right materials. And then Paul goes on and he tells us in verse 14 that if anyone's work which he has built on, it, excuse me, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he says he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Point number four, and finally, if you're taking notes this morning, you could write this down, the right rewards. The right rewards. Let me say this again, only what you do for Jesus will endure in the end. That the rewards, they're, they're referred to in the scriptures, crowns. You have crowns of righteousness, crowns of exaltation, crowns of glory, crowns of life. And he says, on that day, if you built with the right materials, you will be like, a, like an Olympic athlete champion that just finished the race and thinking, wow, I, and you will be awarded a crown. But also, every one of us will be on the Bema seat. And some of us will be filled with regrets because we pursued the seashells in life that in the end, they don't matter. When your life gets tested, what will be left standing? And the only things that will be left standing are the things that you built for the glory of God. And if you wanna receive the right rewards, you've gotta understand that God wants you to live a life of faithfulness, faithful service. And if you don't wanna be filled with regret, then you have to repent of timidity. You have to repent of, of apathy towards sin. And if you don't wanna have an eternity filled with regret at this moment, you've gotta get rid of good intentions. You, you know the mentality, you know what I'm talking about? Well, I plan on doing that. Well, I'm, I, I plan on, I, you know, I, I'm intending on doing that. Let me just say this about intentions and in my own life, that intentions are the kindling that ignite the flames of God's judgment. And I don't know about you, but I've already stored up enough regrets for this judgment. And I wanna spend the rest of my life running diligent the race that God has called me to run so that I can build out of gold, silver, and precious stones something that will be beautiful in God's sight on that day. So this morning, what are you building? Or maybe to put it differently, who are you running with? There's a famous father-son duo that have, that have done many races. Here they are right here. They're called Team Hoyt. And the father, his name is Dick, and the son, his name is Rick. And they did their first race in 1977 when the son, Rick, he said, I wanna help money. I wanna, I wanna help raise money for this guy who, who's been paralyzed. And Rick, he has cerebral palsy and he's a quadriplegic. And so in 77, they enter this race and then that just begins this this lifelong ambition for him, for this Team Hoyt to run all these races together. And obviously you can see that dad is pushing son in every single race. 
And by the time they finished up their career, they had ran in over a thousand marathons and triathlons. There was an article done by People Magazine and they were interviewing Rick, the son. And he said, when we run, it makes me feel like my disability disappears. Last year, Rick's dad, he passed away. And I'm sure that Rick, when he had to bury his dad, I'm sure he, he didn't run to his room or will to his room and just like look at all the awards that they had and think that's what was so significant. No, but the awards that they had won for all the marathons, the Boston marathons that they had done and all the triathlons, the awards that they had won, they were simply a reminder of the relationship that he had with his dad. See, everywhere Rick wanted to go to win the race, his father had to take him to that place. Jesus said in John chapter five, he said that, that most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. And listen, if you wanna build your life on what matters most, then join God in what he's doing. I'm about to pray and then we're gonna sing a song called uh, Refiner's Fire. And it just simply says this, I wanna be tried by fire, purified. And it just says, it goes on to say, take these hands and take these feet or take these instruments that you've given me and, and that you would, you would allow them to be refined and then be used for you, God. And this morning as we sit and listen to this song, I want us just to have a prayer in our heart that says, God, help me to build what matters most. Help me not to waste my life chasing things that in the end don't matter. So if you would, please pray with me as we get ready to listen to this song. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for today. God, we thank you just for your word, how clear it is, how convicting it is. God, I wanna join the ranks of the Apostle Paul and pour out my life as a drink offering unto you. God, I wanna join the ranks of the man that came several months ago, Wes, and he said, I, I want, Jesus, I want you to wipe the tears from my eyes when I, when I meet you face to face, and then I want you to wipe the sweat off my brow because I was spent for your glory. God, reveal to me the motives of my heart, reveal to me the conduct that's displeasing to you, reveal to me the service that I'm squandering, and help me to be pure in my heart, help me to be sincere in my conduct, and help me to be faithful in my service. And God, help us to be a church that isn't just a, a bunch of individual buildings that are glorious to you, but we come together as a collective, as a church that is building a, a church that is beautiful to you. And God, help us to be found faithful for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, Abundant Life Online, what an incredible day to worship with you guys. And I just wanted to ask if you're new, if this is your first time, would you actually let us know in the chat? Because we want to reach out to you, we want to connect with you. Or maybe you should go to livingproof.co slash next steps and take your next steps in Abundant Life. Or maybe you're just like, I want to get to know Kyle. Well, would you email me at kyle.worship at livingproof.co? Because I would love to get to know you. Well, wherever you are, I love you. Can't wait to see you next week.
To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Sing it again. I have decided. 